Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Rukmini Dorkanish Rukmini Dorkanish Rukmini Dorkanish Rukmini Dorkanish Jaya Jagana, Jaya Jagana, Jaya Maladeva, Jaya Subhadra. Jaya Gorani Thai, Gorani Thai, Gorani Thai, Gorani Thai. Nithai Gaur Haribol, 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 Gaur Haribol. Jaya Jaya Prabhupada, 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 Jaya Prabhupada. Jaya Jaya Prabhupada, 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 Srila Prabhupada. Gaur Premanandi Hayari Bo, Jaya Om Vishnu Pad, Padamahangsa Padaprajik Acharya, Asatara Sata Sri Srimad. This can be with the founder of Acharya's Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj Prabhupada Ki Jai. Nitya Lila Prabhisya Om Vishnu Padis of Angra Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada Ki Jai. Ananta Koti Vaishnava Rinda Ki Jai. Nam Acharya Srila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai. Prem Sakahosh Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Dityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara. Shri Vas Adi Gaur Bhakti Rinda Ki Jai. Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gopa Gopana Shama Kunda Radha Kunda Giri Govardhan Ki Jai. Shri Bajamuma Namadam Ki Jai. Shri Nabadit Mayapur Dham Ki Jai. Shila Chal Jagannath Puri Dham Ki Jai. Ganga Mai Ki Jai, Jamuna Mai Ki Jai, Bhakti Devi Ki Jai, Shimati Tulsa Maharani Ki Jai. The most beautiful Lordship, Shri Shukmini Dwarkadish Ki Jai, Shukmini Dwarkanath Ki Jai, Shri Shri Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Ki Jai, Shri Shri Gornitai Ki Jai, Samaveta Bhakti Rinda Ki Jai, Going Back to Home, Back to Godhead Ki Jai, Iskand Los Angeles Yatra Ki Jai, Brihad Bhardaga Transcendental Book Distribution Ki Jai, International Food for Life Transcendental Prasadam Distribution Ki Jai. Shri Hari Nam Sankirtan Ki Jai. Nitai Gaur Premanandi. Hari Hari Ba. All glories to the Assembly of Devotees. All glories to the Assembly of Devotees. All glories to the Assembly of Devotees. All glories, all glories to Shri Shri Guru and Gorong. Glories to the Prophet. Narayanam Namaskritya. Naram Chai Vanarotamam Deving Sarasatim Vyasam Tatoja Yam Hutirayat Before reciting this Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our very means of conquest, let us offer respectful obeisances unto the personality of God and Lord Narayan, unto Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Sarasati, the goddess of learning, unto Srila Vyasadeva, the author, and unto Srila Prabhupada, the translator, commentator, and our spiritual master. Nashta Prayeshu Badreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavata Yuttima Shloka Bhaktir Bhavati Naishiki By regularly attending the Srimad Bhagavatam class and by rendering service unto the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed and loving devotional service unto the personality of God who is worship with transcendental songs becomes established as an irrevocable fact. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 
ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय सो वर कंटिन्यू आवर रीडिंग फ्रॉम द फर्स्ट कैंटो ऑफ द श्रीमद् भागवतम दिस इज चैप्टर 2 डिविनिटी एंड डिवाइन सर्विस एंड टुडेस टेक्स्ट इज 30 यस स एवेदम ससार जाग्रे भगवान आत्म माया सद असद रूपया छासाओ कुन माया गुनो विभु स एवेदम ससार जाग्रे भगवान आत्म माया सद असद रूपया चासौ गुण माया गुण नो विभो स एवे रंग से सर जाग्रे भगवान आत्म माया सद असद रूपया चासौ गुण माया गुणो विभो स एवे रंग से सर जाग्रे भगवान आत्म माया सद सद रूपया चासौ गुण माया गुणो विभो स एवे रंग से सर जाग्रे भगवान आत्म माया सेवे रंग से सर जाग्रे भगवान आत्म माया सद असद रूपया चास गुण माया गुणो विभु स एवे रंग से सर जाग्रे भगवान आया आया स एवे रंग से जाग्रे भगवान आत्म माया वैष्णवींस स एवे रंग से जाग्रे भगवान आत्म माया सद असद रूपया चास गुण माया गुणो विभु सह वैट एव सर्टनली इदम विस ससर्ज क्रिएटेड अग्रे before bhagavan the personality of godhead atma maya by his personal potency sat the cause asat the effect rupaya by forms cha and aso the same lord guna maya in the modes of material nature aguna ha transcendental people who the absolute should the proper translation for this verse in the beginning of the material creation that absolute personality of godhead vasudeva in his transcendental position created the energies of cause and effect by his own internal energy please repeat 
in the beginning of the material creation, that absolute personality of Godhead, Vasudeva, in his transcendental position, created the energies of cause and effect by his own internal energy. Shiloh Prophet's purport. The position of the Lord is always transcendental because the causal and effectual energies required for the creation of the material world were also created by him. He is unaffected, therefore, by the qualities of the material modes. His existence, form, activities, and paraphernalia all existed before the material creation. Now that red asterisk in the database means that if you click on it, it'll give you some further information. And in this case, it's referring to um, Tsankar Ch uh, Charya's statement that Narayana Paro Abhyaktat, that Narayana is beyond the material energy. So, continuing the purport, he is all spiritual and has nothing to do with the qualities of the material world, which are qualitatively distinct from the spiritual qualities of the Lord. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Unmilitam Jaina Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishdang Stapi Tang Jaina Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadama Dayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam Vande Hang Shri Guru Shri Utapada Kamalam Shri Guru Unvaishavangsha Shri Rupam Sagajatam Sahagana Ragana Tanvatam Tang Sajivam Chadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vachangsha Hey Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namosate Tapta Kancha Nagorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshri Vrishnavanu Sute Devi Pandamami Haripre <coughs> Vajra Kopatruvya Shra Kripa Sandubi Evacha Patitanang Pavane Pyo Vaishavi Pyo Namona Maha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Dittananda Shri Advaita Gadad Har Shivasati Gorbakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So although compared to the last couple of purports, this one is very short, still the concepts in this verse are very very important, extremely important for us to understand because if we don't understand the fundamental philosophy of Krishna consciousness, we remain enamored by Krishna's material energy and are sometimes so enamored that we turn our backs on Krishna consciousness and again dive into the material whirlpool. Not only dive in, which is understandable, material energy is so powerful, but some neophyte devotees again, try to disprove the very basic philosophy that's being presented here. We have <clears throat> some prominent cases of that happening currently. That's why I'm mentioning it. Where persons have been picked up out of the material energy, uh, of supposedly washed clean or almost clean, stay for some time, seem to be practicing bhakti yoga. But then because they've been either offensive or weak, they again get attracted to material energy, and then they turn around and try to convince others that Krishna consciousness is not worthwhile, which is very unfortunate. It's one thing if somebody's weak and they fall down, that's quite understandable. Who knows how many times all of us have been through that situation, <clears throat> allowed ourselves to be attracted to Krishna consciousness, the process of bhakti yoga, and then due to weakness or offensive, we, offenses, we fall down. But again, we're given a chance in the future. And therefore, when we come in contact with it again, we're re-attracted. But then to try to convince others that Christian consciousness is not worthwhile, that's really, really bad. <laughs> Their arguments are weak and ineffectual, but they may have some influence on other neophyte devotees. And therefore, they have to be addressed. Uh, Bhajan Narayan Maharaj is currently sending around some papers uh, to dispute arguments put forward by persons in that category. And a couple of them are pretty prominent right now. They were in Krishna consciousness practice for some time to the point of actually being 
somewhat effective in convincing others to become Krishna conscious, but then because they fall down, they then turn around and to justify their own current fallen position, they try to get others to turn away from Krishna consciousness. So this is unfortunate. So these concepts in today's verse are, again, very important to understand, very basic, but very important to understand. So evidam, sasarja agre. So that first point, sasarja agre. Created before. So these personalities that I'm referring to, quite often they again are convinced by modern science. Modern science has explained everything. Modern science can do so much. Modern science, modern. First of all, there's nothing modern here. <laughs> it's been going on since time immemorial. That those who don't want to surrender to, and this is a process of surrender. We can, shouldn't forget that. It's not just a process of acquiring knowledge. It's knowledge which is meant to convince us to surrender to the Supreme Lord in a particular way, through a particular process, not at our own whims then it's not surrender. If I get to choose when, how, where, what I do, then it's not surrender. Then it's whim. It's whimsy. It's whimsical. Surrender means you have to do what the person that you're surrendering to is telling you to do. That's surrender. If you don't, then you're not surrendered. And you're playing games or you're, you know, something is not right there. Surrender means for my own good. In this context, we're suffering in this material world. We should have all come to the point where we realize this. If we think there's happiness to be had here through money, sense gratification, then we're obviously half asleep and we need to be awakened. I've many times mentioned this uh, truism that we were taught as children, uh, but it's very applicable in Christian consciousness. He or she who knows and knows he knows is a wise man. You should seek him. He who knows and knows not he knows is asleep. You should wake him. He who knows not and knows he knows not is a child. You should teach him. And he who knows not and knows not he knows not is a fool. You should shun him. <laughs> so a lot of the so-called educated people fall into that category. They don't know what they're talking about. They're throwing out all kinds of big terms and this and that, terminology. And, but at the end of the day, they can't feed themselves. <laughs> what is the use then of all your big terminologies? Like the boatman and the scholar. You know the story. Big, big scholar from a small village in India. Went away to the big city, became really educated. And all departments of knowledge, very puffed up, proud. Now he wants to go back to his village and show on. But to get there, they have to cross this big river. So he hires one boatman. And on the way across, he's asking the boatman, do you know anything about cosmology? No, I don't know anything. Ah, your life is being wasted. A quarter of your life is gone. Do you know anything about philosophy in general? No, I don't know any philosophy. Ah, half your life is gone. Do you know anything about zoology? Ah, no, I never heard of it. Ah, three quarters of your life is wasted. And then a big storm comes, it is rocking big waves, and the boat is rocking. Finally, they have to abandon the boat. And the boatman says, do you know how to swim? No, your whole life is wasted. <laughs> so it's like that. They're spending their whole lives piling up this department of knowledge, that department of knowledge, and they sound so erudite when they get on, nowadays especially, their social media, they write one paper and it's spread all over the world, and they're saying, ah, foolish people don't understand that you know, there is no God. You don't need any God. We can explain everything to you. You don't, you don't know what causes hurricanes, and therefore you think you have to pray to God. To, but we know what causes hurricanes. We can tell you. Yeah, you know what causes hurricanes, but can you stop them? Can you stop them? No. Can you at least help us recover in the aftermath of the hurricane? No. So what's the use of your knowledge of how hurricanes are formed? Who cares? Right now in Puerto Rico, they have got slammed by that hurricane. An entire island lost power. So you miss a big, big scholar. Can you flip one switch and turn all the lights back on? No. So who cares for your knowledge of electricity then? <laughs> you see? Big, big, prophet would quote that proverb. Big, big monkey, big, big belly. Still on jumping. Ah, oh, melancholy. <laughs> so 
They're like the big, big monkey with the big, big belly. And when you ask them to do something really, really important, really, really impressive, ah, oh, can't do it. So we're not impressed then by your piling up all the so-called knowledge. By your so-called knowledge, can you save yourself from dying? No. Can you feed yourself? No. All the important things in life, they can't do. So what is the use of all this piling up of knowledge then? Ah, but we gave you television. And now it's flat screen television. It's so thin you can hang it on a wall. But the programming is still the same. You turn on the television and you get the same stuff. Accident on the 405. You know, somebody got murdered in this place and that place. It's the same news. So what's the use of your thin, thin flat screen television? It's not giving us any important information like how to get out of the cycle of birth and death. How we can feed ourselves after the hurricane has devastated the entire island or entire community. So that knowledge they don't have. So here it's being stated, Krishna is existing before the creation and creation is done by him. Another, you know, funny joke that's used to disprove the scientist's importance. But it's, it's, it's funny, but it's factual. That one scientist, you know, is trying to impress all not-so-educated people. You people still believe in God, but whatever so-called God has done, we can do. So the simple people said, really? Okay. So God is watching the whole thing. And he comes and he says, so you think you can do whatever I've done? And the scientist said, yeah, you're supposed to be God. Whatever you can do, I can do. So God takes the clay, makes a human form, breathes into it, and it comes to life. Scientists say, ah, we can do that. So he starts making a clay prop. God says, get your own clay. You see? <laughs> they can take God's energy and shape it this way, that way, and be impressed by it. But they can't create from themselves. Atma Maya, it's mentioned in today's verse. From his own self, everything is coming. We take that lightly, but it's extremely important. If you are being celebrated as being a creator of this or that, whether it's televisions or cars or Sputniks or whatever, where did you get that energy from? Prophet said, go further. Where did you get the brain from? Who has created the brain of this so-called celebrated scientist? Celebrated so-called scientist. So everything is coming from God and a simple person can see through all of the smoke and hype and understand that yes, at the end of the day, after they throw all the TVs at you and all the cars at you and all the airplanes at you, we're still no better off. Actually, we're worse off. We're worse off because all that energy that goes into manufacturing this and that is simply destroying the planet. Simply destroying the planet. It's not making life really any better. But, but in 11 hours, you can fly from L.A. to Paris, like I just did. But it means for 11 hours, you're locked up in a tin can, and now they've made a plane so big, there are like 500 people in it, and they're all breathing the same recycled air. By the time you get down, you have a headache, you can't, it's like, it's not good. So every so-called scientific advancement has its downside. And their attempts to mitigate the problems just create more problems. That's on and on and on. And again, at the end of the day, they can't do anything that's really, really meaningful, like preventing us from dying, preventing themselves from dying, feeding themselves. And it's not just we're saying that. Any scientist you think that create, can create food, let them come forward. We'll put them in a lab, give them all the raw material, all the hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, whatever raw material you want. Make an apple. And we're not going to give you anything to eat until you can make something edible. They can't do it. So what is the use of all your big, big science if you can't even feed yourself? You see? So we should not be swayed <clears throat> by the so-called modern scientific presentation. First of all, it's not modern. Since time immemorial, people have fallen into that category of trying to disprove the existence of God. Trying to say that they can do whatever God, so-called God has done. But they can't. Krishna has always existed, is existing, will continue to exist in the future. And every so-called scientist that has ever come along is gone. And what have they accomplished? 
what have they accomplished? <clears throat> Anybody want to say something that's so far out that this world would, could not have gone on without it? What have they accomplished, literally? Electricity. It's not created by them. <laughs> Electrical energy has always been there. Now, you may have harnessed that electrical energy to do some work. <clears throat> but again, what is the end result? What is the end result? What have they actually accomplished with that electrical energy that we couldn't do without? You see, there, there's nothing really. There's nothing. It's just smoke and mirrors and hype. So unfortunately, again, neophyte devotees, due to being weak or being committing offenses, they again become attracted to this material life, which ultimately means buying into the presentation of material scientists. And foolishly, they try to convince others that, no, there is no God, you don't need God, there is no such, you know, it's just, it's, it's foolish. So we should, again, allow ourselves to be convinced by the divine, supreme intelligence, Krishna and his representatives. Next point is Bhagavan. We've heard, we hear this word so often that we don't really meditate on it. But... Bhagya means opulence and Bhagavan means one who possesses. And the great sage Parasar Muni has elaborated or enumerated six opulences that Bhagavan possesses in full. We all have to some minute degree. Aishvaryasya, Samagrasya, Abhiryasya, Yashasya, Kriya, Jnana, Vairagya, Yostraiva, Shana, Bhagya, Itingana. We should meditate on these points. Opulence, money, is attractive. It's attractive. It's an attractive force. But even the wealthiest person on this planet at present, first of all, whatever he's claiming or she's claiming to possess is not really there as we know. They're born with nothing, just like all of us, and when they die, they can't take one cent with them. So in the interim, because you've been given stewardship of a few dollars or a few thousand dollars or a few million dollars or even a few billion dollars, you become puffed up, thinking that now makes you better than everybody else and you can solve so many problems. And But it doesn't. It doesn't. Karma is still there. The prophet says, since time immemorial, the wealthy people have been trying to solve the poverty problem and they've set up this program, that program, and giving money here and there. But in every generation, there's still poor people living on the footpath. <laughs> no matter, in spite of all their endeavors, to eradicate poverty and eradicate this and that and that. it still goes on because it's karmic it's karmic and if some or other you take somebody whose karma is to be poor in this life and you give them millions of dollars come back in a few weeks a few years it's gone again there <laughs> it happens regularly either through lottery or somebody's generosity somebody whose karma it is to be poor in this life they get a few dollars and they can't keep it and the person who gave it to them wonders, what a fool, I gave you $10 million and now you're poor again. Well, you're so foolish, why didn't you manage your money properly? Well, it's karma. It's not this person's karma to have money in this lifetime. So Aishwarya says, someone said, virya, strength, again, extractive force if you're, but even the strongest person on this planet, they can lift whatever, 500 kgs, whatever. For a period of time, it seems impressive. Again, when they're born, no such ability. And gradually, gradually, the body gets stronger and we become more and more puffed up and you get to the point where now I can lift so much. Wait a while. Wait a while. <laughs> that same body, doing a little sit up, you can't even lift up your spoon anymore. You can't even lift up your eyeglasses. Literally, it happens. You visit any nursing home, old folks home. A lot of these people were at one point physically strong, mentally very capable. Now, my own mother, I just visited her a few days ago. Very, very sharp materially. She's from a family of very, very sharp individuals. They all became professionals and intellectually very astute. Now, because of dementia, combination of factors, literally all day she sits and just stares at the wall. And this is what happens in the material situation. We become so puffed up by our material abilities that we forget that time is ticking along. And that time will bring down the head of the most puffed up person. Bring it down. So again, we should take it seriously. We have been given this opportunity to understand these basic concepts thoroughly. Aishvarya, Samagrasya, Viryasya, Yashasya, fame. People are again enamored by fame. 
If somebody's famous, oh, there's so-and-so, oh, there's so-and-so. Give it a time again. In a few years, a few decades, nobody remembers so-and-so. So many famous people from the past. Big guns in their days. And if you throw those names out now, nobody knows. It's like, who? What? <laughs> Never heard of them. <laughs> or they've heard of them, but they have no idea what they were famous for. It's like that. So fame in this material world is fleeting. Here today, gone tomorrow. Don't be enamored by it. Don't be enamored by somebody else's so-called fame and don't yourself try to become so famous because it's not going to last. Yashashakshriya. Personal, physical beauty. Again, borrowed plumage. Krishna's beauty is eternal, ever-increasing. On the spiritual world, everybody's like that, not just Krishna. But... On the material platform, that beauty, again, is borrowed plumage. It's borrowed plumage. It doesn't last. Attractive for a few days, doesn't last. It's like that story of the jackal, jungle kiraj. The jungle, the jackal, hungry, starving, stumbling around through the village at night, falls into a vat of blue dye. He doesn't even realize what has happened, but the next day, because his body is now blue, all the other animals are like, ooh, blue. I never saw an animal with a bright blue color like that. So they all begin to worship him and bring so many presentations. And so now he's thinking, oh, wow, I'm some important person. And he's giving orders and I don't like this. Bring me another one. But time goes by, the rain comes and the blue disappears. And now he's back to being a jackal. Ah, get out of here. Everybody chases him. So it's like that. Our fame in this world is like that. Uh, fleeting, ephemeral, does not last. Yashasha and Shriya, our beauty doesn't last. Fame doesn't last. Gana. Knowledge. Again, very attractive force. If you're very learned, can speak at length about anything under the sun. Some people are very proud of that. They have such vast general knowledge, whether you talk about literature or politics or whatever you talk about, they can go on talking for hours and hours and hours. <clears throat> but the first question is, where did you get that knowledge from? Where did you get it from? That's the first question an intelligent person will ask. Where did you get that knowledge from? And if we ponder, all of us, we have to admit that anything that we know that is worth knowing we learn from somebody else. <laughs> how to drive a car, how to make a car, anything that's of any importance, we learn from somebody else. And the modern self-made men and women, they don't like to admit that. They want you to teach them the general principles, the general principles of programming. So I can go and program something important and make money. But without those general principles, what you, would you have done? <laughs> if somebody didn't teach, teach you that basic programming skill, what would you have made? Nothing. Zero. So anybody who knows anything is, owes at least a debt of gratitude to someone who taught them, at least the very basics. You may become puffed up that I advance you know, this programming skill to the next level. And I took it to the next level. But without that first level, you wouldn't have gotten anywhere. So, and that's just material knowledge. What to speak of spiritual knowledge. There's no, you cannot, by your intellectual prowess, understand anything on the spiritual platform. That has to come by somebody's mercy being handed down to you. So this is our position. We're not enamored by material knowledge. And the real knowledge that we're after, spiritual knowledge, knowledge of the absolute truth, we know is coming down in the cyclic succession. And therefore, we owe a debt of gratitude to our predecessor Acharyas. We don't try to usurp their position. We try to serve them by distributing that knowledge. <clears throat> then vairagya, renunciation. If a person is very renounced, <clears throat> not attached to possessions, especially if they have a lot and they're not attached to it. Oh, that's very, very special. George Harrison was kind of in that category. He made a lot of money as a Beatle and through other sources, but he remained a pretty humble guy. He was not overwhelmed by his... As a matter of fact, he was incredible, incredulous that 
He said, I have so much money, and yet wherever I go, people want to give me things. Hey, George, take this, take this. <laughs> you know, he was like, whoa, this is crazy. This is crazy. I already have so much, and people want to give me stuff. So he was not very... But the point is, we don't really have anything. Again, whatever you so-called have, where did it come from? Who gave it to you? How did you acquire it? And it's already owned by Krishna. It's already owned by God. So these very, very simple points we have to allow to sink into our minds. And then we become more and more convinced to surrender to that person who is full in all of those opulences. And they're not <clears throat> fleeting. They're not ephemeral. They will, they're ever-increasing. They will last forever and ever and ever and ever. And therefore, we're not so puffed up by whatever tiny fraction of those opulences that we get, whether it's money or fame or beauty or strength or whatever, knowing very well it came of its own accord and it will go away in the future. So we allow ourselves to be attracted by the Supreme Person, Bhagavan, who possesses all of those opulences in full, and we are, again, convinced, allow ourselves to be convinced to surrender, because if we don't actually surrender, then we find this phenomenon that I mentioned in the beginning. That for some time, it seems like this person is practicing Krishna consciousness to the point of being convinced to go out and convince others by distributing books especially. And then because they don't really allow these basic points to sink in or because they become offensive, again, maya becomes attractive to them. But that maya belongs to Krishna. It's not ours. That maya that we chase after for gratification it does not belong to us. At least that much you have to admit. <laughs> This material energy that you're chasing after and transforming, it's not yours. You know, nobody is attracted so much to the raw earth. But the raw earth is providing everything that we have. A, a person who's trained, metallurgist, can take some ore out of the ground, recognize that this is iron ore, this is copper, this is aluminum, this is whatever. Average person can't do that. You give them a clump of earth and say, eh. But when the trained personalities, they take that earth and they refine it into iron, steel, copper, whatever, we're still not so impressed. If you see a big roll of steel, it's like, hmm, okay. But when you take that steel and transform it into a, a Toyota, a hmm, little bit attracted, I can get from here to there. But when you turn it into a BMW, ah, oh, I'm more attracted. Or a Rolls Royce or something like that. It's the same earth. It's just a transformation of earth. That earth ore has been transformed into steel, into a BMW or whatever, then we become attracted. But at every step of the way, every stage, it belongs to Krishna. It's not ours. It's not ours. Again, these basic points we have to allow to sink in. Otherwise, we become, again, enamored of Krishna's energy and we want to enjoy Krishna's energy without Krishna and we want to convince others not to surrender to Krishna. That is the biggest unfortunate mistake. It's one thing if you're weak yourself and you're running after Maya. Okay, fine. Hopefully you'll wake up one day and come back. But to, from that fallen position, try to convince others to fall down, to convince others to defy God, that is very unfortunate. And that we cannot tolerate. <laughs> we cannot tolerate. As Christians, aspiring servants, we have to try to our best to convince others not to listen to such personalities. We have to point out the flaws in their arguments, just like we point out the flaws in the general scientific presentation. And then we leave it up to the individual's, you know, karma, their individual status, whether they are fortunate enough to understand and accept what's being presented. But our duty, at least, is to make the presentation. But first, we have to understand ourselves. If we're not solidly on the platform of surrender, then how can we convince others that it's a worthwhile platform to stand on? We can't. We can't. If we're not attached to the Kirtan Ras, the Kirtan is the panacea for Kali Yuga, for all times, but especially Kali Yuga. Become attached to the holy name, hearing the holy name, chanting the holy name, giving it to others. But if we're not attached to hearing and chanting the holy name ourselves, how can we give it to others? We can't. We can't. And therefore, we have to, each of us, examine how attached am I to chanting Hare Krishna? Am I really attached? And if I'm not, then I have to, and even if I am, even if I think I am, then I have to deepen that attachment. So that was one of the main themes at this Bhakti Sangam festival that I went to. How to deepen our attachment to chanting Hare Krishna. Sincerely deepen it. Enthusiastically deepen our attachment. 
Because the more we become attached to chanting Hare Krishna, the more we are allowing ourselves to be saved, and the more we can become instruments for saving others. Hare Krishna, we can stop here. Any questions, comments? Okay, bring a party first as usual. I told him sincerely a few days ago, you asked so many questions, you should keep a book of your questions. Write them down. And write down the responses. Hi. That would be such a nice book. <laughs> okay, Brigo, what do you have? Okay, thank you. Thank you for a nice class, as usual. Um, you know, there's two sayings. One is, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And another one, just like it, is a stitch in time saves nine. And uh, where I'm coming from with that is that I I'm aware of the two people that you were referring to, you know, who uh, Bajin Raimaraj is now writing a paper to... They're not the only ones, but yeah. Okay, there's probably more than them. <laughs> two that I have in mind anyway, yeah. since you didn't mention names, I'm not going to mention names. I traveled with both of them on Sankirtan when they were brand new devotees. And uh, I found them to be extremely sincere in every different which way, not just like hardworking, but submissive and nice, saintly, you know, and, and I'm very deeply dismayed by what's happened. And I really, I'm really disturbed, you know, because I just feel like, damn, what, you know, I mean, what do we, what, what's wrong? Why, why, can't, why can't we keep people that are that sincere? Because they were, you know? I mean, they were like, you know, saintly fellows, you know? And uh, I just like to hear what you have to say about that. It's called free will. This has been going on again since time immemorial. It's, these are not the first victims of Maya. We're all victims of Maya. <laughs> and we're trying to get out of that victimized position by following the path of Bhakti Yoga. Did you ever hear this? I, mean, I never heard Papa say this, but I had devotees tell me this. That Papa said, when somebody leaves, we should be feeling it's 50% their fault and 50% our fault. Yeah. So is there something, is, is that yeah. a bona fide statement? Or? Well, who am I to say if it was bona fide? Yes, I have heard that statement that Papa said that. 50% our fault, 50% theirs. Prabhupada, I heard devotees told me that Prabhupada said, when people leave, we should think that it's 50% their fault, but 50% our fault. Yeah. But at the end of the day, though, it all comes down to free will and your desire to save your own neck. If you have no desire to save yourself, then no matter what anybody does, says, how well wishing they are, you're not going to be saved. The example is, again, if that person has fallen into a deep well and they're calling up, help, help, because they can't get out by themselves. They know that. And if somebody finally hears them and comes and throws down a rope, and they, start, they hold on to the rope, and they start being pulled up. But along the way, you know, a little bit of honey starts falling on the tongue, and they start licking it, and it tastes good, and then they don't want to go any further. Either they let go of the rope, or they prevent themselves from going any further. So, it's a question of free will. If we really, really understand our existential position, the, the quagmire that we're in, then we become so sincere that there's no looking back. We just zoom back to Godhead. But if we're not completely sincere, if we're not completely convinced of the bad position that we're in, then we allow ourselves to be distracted. And that is very difficult for anyone to overcome if you allow yourself to be distracted. You can't blame that on the GBC. You can't blame that on the temple president. You know, you can't blame that really on anybody. Your parents, just like in the material world, it's very fashionable and favorable. Uh, and, and, and it's in favor right now to blame your parents for everything that's wrong in your life. Everything that's wrong. If you're an adult and you're having this problem, that problem, then it's your parents' fault. To the point of some people wanting to sue their parents because it's their fault. So but I, somewhere along the line, you have to take responsibility for your own existence. Okay. And that's the same thing in Krishna consciousness. Yes, you may have had a rough ashram life. You may have had this to go wrong, that go wrong. But at the end of the day, you're in this mature world. Death is imminent. Allow yourself to be saved. Allow yourself to be saved. And if you don't, then you can't blame it again on the leaders of the society or your parents or anybody else. It's your fault for not opening your eyes fully and seeing what's going on. Okay, I agree with what you said. So, so therefore, is the only acceptable course of action at this point, considering what's happened, to square off and now, like, you know, counterattack them? Or it, you know, would it be considered incorrect to still try to reach no, out? No, it's not counterattacking. We're not attacking these individuals. We understand their situation. What we're trying to do is prophylactic, trying to prevent others from winding up in the same situation. 
And we can see, those of us who've been around long enough, we have the general experience that we can kind of see. You can kind of see already who's gradually or rapidly falling into that situation. The pitfall of not surrendering and therefore again being attracted to Maya. And on top of that, trying to undermine other people's positions by convincing them that they're wrong for practicing Christian consciousness. That is the most unfortunate part. Again, if you're weak and you fall down, there's a chance. But if you try to convince others to leave Christian consciousness, then you're putting yourself in a very, very, very bad position. Anyway, we've gone over time. We can stop here. Grantarashim, Bhagavatam, Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai, Gaur Bhaktivrinda, Ki Jai.